Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's free session on async reading comprehension. First things first, let me introduce myself. My name is Harsha. I'm one of the principal subject matter experts here at EGMAT, and I'm going to be one of the hosts for today's session. We will also have Rajat joining us. Rajat is, of course, the one of the founders of EGMAT and currently also serves as the, as the CMO of the company. But uh, at, at his heart, he's also a hardcore subject matter expert. So you'll also get to see that side of him today. So he will join us in a little bit of time. Meanwhile, I'm going to start the session with you today. So great to have all of you here. I already see 50 of you and more of you are joining in as I speak. So today's session is all about giving you certain strategies that can help you do more with regard to reading comprehension. And in order to give you a sense of what is coming your way today, we had sent a couple of these video lessons. Uh, you would have received it on mail if you're registered for today's session. So if you've gone through them, that's great. It would give you a full feel and flavor for the kind of thing that we're going to do today. But even otherwise, uh, once the session is done, if you found this valuable, if you want to explore the EGMAT universe a little more, if you want to see, practice some of what you've learned today on more questions, this is a resource for you. This is part of your free trial, these sessions. All right, check those out. Now, um, very quick question. How many of you are attending a, an EGMAT seminar for the first time? Let's get to know that. For how many of you, like this is the first time I'm attending an EGMAT seminar. That's gonna be, hopefully it's interesting for you. You're trying to figure out what it's all about. All right. So this tells me that, you know, around almost 70% of us are here for the first time. You guys are attending one of our seminars for the first time. So a grand welcome of you. I hope that the next two and a half to three hours that you spend with us is worth your time. Now, one thing you should know is we at EGMAT, we conduct free sessions every single weekend, every Saturday, every Sunday, typically we have a session on select topics from the GMAT. Now, one of the main reasons we do this is we want to demystify the preparation aspect of GMAT and very specifically with regard to the subject matter. What I mean is you don't have to go into the GMAT without a method. Every single question type, there is a way to solve. There are processes that can work there are processes that are scalable. So through these sessions, we want to make it known in the student community that, you know, whether it is geometry, whether it is number properties, whether it is sentence correction, or whether it is reading comprehension, there are ways to handle those questions. So that's what we do. So for those of you, today you're here for an RC seminar, but for those of you who are looking for a little bit of help with geometry, tomorrow we have our geometry webinar, and this will be focused on quadrilaterals very specifically. And again, you will see certain processes at work which are scalable. Next Saturday is our flagship SC webinar. Here we introduce what is called as the meaning-based approach. Now, uh, a long time ago, EGMAT actually pioneered and came up with the meaning-based approach. Today, there are quite a, bit, quite a few copycats as well, uh, but we pioneered it and it's a method that can help you get down to the root of what's happening in, in the, with your SC questions. And it's very, very useful. So for those of you who are looking for a bit of a boost with regard to SC, this session that's coming next Saturday at the same time is worth your time. With that, let's get to know you guys a little better. So I do have one question already on the screen and that is, when do you plan to take the GMAT? What kind of timeline is this batch in general looking at? Let's also introduce another piece of data that's usually interesting. Let's understand the motivation of the group. You're here with me on a Saturday, either morning or afternoon or evening. There must be something in your mind right, in terms of a target score that you want to achieve. So let's register that as well. All right, let me start broadcasting those results as well. So first, let me look at the first piece of data. When do you plan to take the GMAT? Um, there are 13% of us who are planning to take it in two weeks. Um, all the best for the exam. Uh, even with just two weeks to go, what you're learning today can help you. If you're able to apply some of the things that you learned today on even say, let's say 15 to 20 passages, you should see a certain level of improvement uh, that should give you a boost in your RC. And a lot of us, a vast majority of us, you know, are beyond that 45 day mark in terms of either we haven't booked a date or, you know, the timeline is more than two months away. Uh, for you folks, this is a very, very good chance to get to know how we at EGMAT solve RC and, uh, it will give you food for thought. Does this method work for you? Then you can consider, you know, signing up with us. Uh, you can explore more. We have a fantastic free trial. You guys can check it out. There's a lot of content there. 
makes sense now let's look at the ambition of the batch that's something i always like to see so it's fantastic to see so many of us having that target score that is upwards of 730 uh we will come back to that in the session i am going to ask you to stay motivated throughout the session remember you are here because you want around almost 30 65 67 68% of us want a target score that is upwards of that 720 mark right keep that in mind throughout all the time all right with that let's move to the main presentation pin and uh, you should see the change, the screen change for you a little bit uh, it might take a little bit of time for the presentation to load meanwhile let me make sure that the real estate is understood so at the bottom of the screen you have this q and a so it's this one that i'm just shaking right now this particular poll this q and a pod is where you ask questions to us at some point either related to the subject matter that is rc or you know related to your gmat preparation you might have questions regarding your gmat preparation to the best of our ability we'd be happy to take those in this session um uh, the real estate on the right where you see this poll floating right now this is where i ask you questions now the only thing that i ask of you is participate this is not meant to be a one way lecture as in we could give a you know we could give a lecture but that's boring and on a saturday you don't want that so make the most of the session participate that's the best way to do it so i ask a question make sure that you hit you know you do that analysis and hit a button okay so that's there so very quick uh, let's test whether you guys are active if you guys can see reading comprehension a black color presentation just put yes on this short answer pod that's on your right so that way you know get into that feel of being trigger happy all right that's good let me take this away so let's get into the agenda of the day what is it that we are here for right and before i do that just give me one second so that i can annotate on the screen that way you guys can follow the thought that you know that's coming from me all right so there are fundamentally three parts to this webinar uh, invariably in these sessions we do have a lot of people who are you know exploring getting into the gmat preparation aspect for the first time uh exploring e gmat for the first time as we have already seen so i'm going to spend around 6 minutes talking about gmat preparation and what we offer here uh the main session is going to be around 2 hours so we're going to discuss a sum total of three passages this is not the kind of session where you do you know 10 or 15 passages no this is a, what i like to call a skill building session three passages but you'll find a lot of value there and then of course uh rajat will be there towards the end of the session if you have any questions we'd be happy to address those as well and i do see there are already a few questions coming in in the q and a we will address that do not worry about it uh may take a little bit of time for me or somebody to get to it but we will address those questions so good to see that participation all right so the one thing that i really want all of you to understand especially those who are getting into gmat preparation for the first time um retakers you guys will be very familiar with this the gmat is not the kind of exam where you just mug up the concepts and then go vomit on the test it doesn't work that way especially those of you who have taken the exam and are here trying to improve your performance you guys know what i'm talking about the gmat is a test of certain skills right you can learn the concept you can practice a few questions but that doesn't guarantee that you pick up the skills and that's the reason a lot of people take multiple attempts with the exam the question is does the person have the skill how does a person build the skill now there is a tiny minority of people who by virtue of what they have done in their life before maybe they work maybe something else already have these skills in place to a certain level for these folks you know just preparing what is there in learning all the concepts just practicing a few questions that gets them to that target score but that's not all of us in fact for a vast majority of us a lot of these skills have to be built now one example of what i mean by skill is your ability to draw inferences from what you're reading it is tested not just in verbal not just in let's say sc or cr or rc it's tested even in quant even with your quant questions you need to be able to draw inferences if you want to do anything on the gmat now that's an example of a skill the question is for those of you who do not always already have the skill to the required level you would require some kind of preparation and that's kind of where the entire gmat prep universe comes in so broadly there are two architectures of learning that have been followed right and uh, these are called the book based architecture which is self explanatory it's like your textbooks or audio visual files in the form of textbooks you have chapters so at some point of time you have some test or unit test the point 
the problem with a book based architecture is a lot depends on you you do not get feedback on every single thing that you do at some point you take a test then you realize that oh i did not learn this as properly as i should that feedback sometimes comes in too late contrast this with the other kind of architecture that's out there which is what we call a private tutoring based architecture this is like you have a private tutor who is monitoring everything you do even a single file you do you get feedback if you have not done that well you will know you have to do it again so the fundamental difference is the level of personalization and the level of feedback that you get and that's the reason i'm talking about this because it has a huge impact on the way you prepare for your gmat i'm going to take one example to make this point clear and that example is that initial step of gmat preparation that is making a study plan so you are somebody who's decided that yes gmat is that exam which i want to write great i want that 730 740 770 whatever your target is what do you do then the mistake a lot of students make at this stage is to just go to the internet and download some random study plan the problem with that is it might work for you but uh, the chances are less it's not tailored to what you actually require so uh, we do not do that here for every student who comes here we want to customize and personalize that study path towards success now how do you do that you have to be able to identify where you are right now some of you might already be great at rc and need more help with sc for some of you rc is a pain which is what i imagine if you are here whereas you guys are probably very very strong with cr very very strong with quant right your path varies how you prepare varies the amount of time you have to put in the sequence in which you should study everything varies basis that so we try to understand that identify where you are right now we know where you need to go we plot that path so at egmat there are only two sources we accept as far as starting abilities is concerned either if you are a retaker you have taken the actual exam so we'll have your official score provided it's recent that gives us an idea of where you are right now otherwise you know we some of our students take our mock sigma x mock and again this is this gives us a very strong idea about where you are let's say with regard to sc with regard to cr with regard to rc broken down at a subsection level once we have the starting ability everything gets personalized as per what you require now uh, we over a, because we've been here in this business for a long time we have the success paths of thousands of students we were able to build an ai which practically looks at what where you are where you need to go and tells you the most optimum path to get you there so we were able to define what your target abilities should be and this varies person to person for somebody who's not that strong with rc but need has a certain target score but is let's say pretty very good with sc the kind of target ability would be tailored the kind of target ability that is being set would be tailored as per that for somebody else this path would be completely different so the system is able to figure that out and what this does is you don't waste time your path the path that you pick for studying for the exam is very very optimized it's personalized to you it is usually much much better than anything you can just rip off from the internet so that's one way that the entire private tutoring based architecture helps develop those necessary core skills in the right way the reason i'm emphasizing this difference is because it has what has translated to a lot of success for us since 2021 3 out of every 5 700 plus scores that you would see on gmat club come from egmat and when i say scores i'm talking about verified scores verified by gc admins gmat club admins for those of you who are in gc right which means 60% of all success since 2021 comes from us that's not a fluke that's because of the kind of architecture that's developed that's because of the kind of processes that we have built with regard to each of these question types and that's something that you're going to see today with rc right so we had the i mean a lot of you who are aware of egmat you know us for our verbal course but in 2020 we wanted to change that we came up with q since 2021 we came up with our revamped quant course and you can see the kind of success that we've had since then far more q49 plus scores than anyone else and of course that also translates to the five star reviews that you would see on gc right so what the bottom line of what i'm saying is uh, go private tutoring based approach build a focus on building those core skills rather than just the blind practice after learning the concept concepts you can get anywhere but are you really building those skills those are the things that you need to always keep in mind so i gave you some statistical evidence but also look at a little bit of analy- uh, anecdotal data these are some of our students 
while we categorize these as success stories these are also failure stories a lot of these students did not succeed the first time they realized what went wrong how and then we were able to help them so these are success stories but they all they also you'll also get a glimpse of what did not work for them what did they have to unlearn and what did they had to correct to get to that target score so always useful to listen to people who have been in your shoes and uh, for those of you who are active on linkedin who believe that you know networking is very very important feel free to connect with our founder rajat rajat is extremely well networked in not just the gmat universe also the admissions universe in fact through rajat you can actually connect with a lot of egmat alums who are in a lot of those universities that you are as- aspiring for so feel free to check this out as well with that good to see all of you let's come to the second part of the session which is where we talk about rc in particular right so uh i see a question here in our area we often have parker oh do not worry about that you will get the recording of today's session so don't worry about that okay so here is a quick question for you and let me ask this question so what should be your let's say in percentile what kind of percentile should you get if you want to get you know a 730 or a 740 as far as rc is concerned what do you think would be a correct answer for this i like how how so many of us have this clarity already which means you guys have done a bit of research on this yes you need that 90 at a percentile or above typically if you want to get this course now if you are freakishly good in let's say some other subsection you can you know go down a little bit you may survive with an 85 or an 80 or something but typically you want to get a 95th percentile if you want to aspire to the kind of score that you're looking for right now the question is let's talk about how we are going to get there now with rc sessions there is a question that i always ask students and uh, this question is very very important it's uh, it, it it kind of tells me a lot about the batch and you know how the batch is the question is very simple i'm going to bring this yes no poll for this purpose how many of you like rc how many of you enjoy rc the minute an rc passage pops up on your screen you're like wow fantastic this is what i wanted in life how many of you get that feeling and let's be honest this is a completely low risk environment i'm not sitting here noting down your names and judging you for saying no i don't like rc or judging you for saying yes i like rc so feel free to dump your emotions there with all your answers so the results are very very illustrative and you you see i see this often this is the reason i asked this question most of us in reality do not enjoy rc at all there is something about rc that you know irks us so i, I can already see answers coming in and that is my next question in fact especially for those of you who don't like rc why do you not like rc what is it about rc that's you know irritating you or what is it that you're afraid of let's kind of register that as well too much to read so you are attributing uh, you, you are kind of talking about length so long passages you don't have a reading habit okay lack of a reading habit okay i get that as well uninterested topics so sometimes you don't you don't find you know the topic is interesting ambiguity in questions and options yeah once you understand rc you will see that there's barely any ambiguity there jargons used you're talking about complex words what else not enough time to enjoy and understand oh i'm here to burst that bubble you have more than enough time to do rc well confusing answer choices all right information gets missed so that's about being able to handle that much of load most of the topics are not common day to day so again topics being unfamiliar topics being boring uh complex words i usually also see complex sentences so we're going to come back to this these are all important points you know the lack of a reading habit the link the topics the words sentences being complex important points we are going to come back and address this in a while so let me ask another question and here i want to understand what's your current way of solving rc right so uh, essentially usually there are three ways and then there are variations of this 
the first approach is to skim through the passage it doesn't spend two, under 2 minutes you get a overall picture of what's happening a bird's eye view of what's happening then you go to the questions and then as per requirement you'll go back to the passage the second is a questions first approach you look at the questions you have a sense of where you need to focus you use that understanding to go through the passage that way you you know save a little bit of time the third approach is you're not skimming through you're taking your time with the passage and then and only then going to the questions so this batch what is the way that you guys do rc all right i am very very happy to see around 75 i mean of the people who have participated so far 75% of us follow method 3 um in our experience in our experience in this industry specific to the gmat i'm not going to talk about any other exam here but specific to gmat one skimming through the passage is a bad way for gmat rc so is questions first reading the passage properly slowly is actually the best way to go this is our understanding from all our years of experience i'm happy to see 75% of us are already trying to do this so for those of you who are already trying to do this hopefully this session will inch you a little bit more towards you know being better at it for those of you who are followers of methods 1 and 2 hopefully by the end of the session i will convince you that method 3 is the way to go so it's good to understand this now the last question i have before we jump into the content and this is what i like to call the self appraisal question in your understanding once you have read a passage how much of the passage have you actually understood so if this was a company and this was a appraisal this would be your self appraisal of how well you are actually reading passages in your own judgment all right so half of us are in that 50 to 75% range if you want to get into that target scores that most of us are targeting you need to have upwards of 90% comprehension because that's where you'll be able to answer all those questions correctly without and without being unsure about anything that's where your killer rc performance will come from so this batch i hope that we take you a little bit closer to this particular point right now a lot of us are not there yet in our own judgment which is fine all right so very specifically what are the things that you're going to get from today's session um first for the first things first we're going to learn how to read an rc passage so i'm going to demonstrate to you the way to read an rc passage there are right ways of doing it there are wrong ways of doing it for example skipping skimming rushing are horrible for all things gmat including rc so i'm going to show you how we read passages we at gmat read passages so we're going to see that along with that you're going to see, i'm going to introduce to you certain reading strategies so the right way of reading plus certain reading strategies you will start extracting much more from the passage while that alone is never sufficient you should be able to use that information to actually answer the questions so we are going to solve two baby passages and specifically solve a main point question and inference question through this you are going to see how proper reading through reading strategies will help you answer these questions you'll also learn some things through this particular section you'll learn how answer choice analysis works you'll see how granular answer choice analysis actually is some of you might be surprised to see how it goes you'll also learn something about rc inferences i promise some of you i know will have a certain confusion about this we'll give you a little bit of clarity on this as well so i hope you're looking forward to that now the proof of the pudding is in the eating so once steps 1 and 2 are done we are going to take it forward we are going to solve an official passage which is somewhere in that 700 level zone and through this passage we are going to show you how points 1 and point 2 points 1 and 2 will help you crack the passage open you'll be able to solve it right uh, and you will see how these methods can help you solve these kinds of passages after that we will specifically talk about how do you go about studying for rc how do you go about preparing for rc if you have a 90th percentile ability as a target how does somebody at that level or somebody aspiring to that level actually prepare all right now now this is this point is important keep this what i'm going to say now is something i want you to imbibe now remember i asked you about your feelings about rc all your emotions about rc and a lot of those emotions were negative we are concerned about the topic either because it is unfamiliar or because it's boring some of us are worried about the length oh it's so long who is going to read it? i i lose patience by the time i'm done reading a passage 
that's some of us a lot of us struggled with jargon words so complexity in terms of words some of us would also talk about sentences and all of these aspects are drawing us back are keeping us back from properly investing in learning rc think about any subject you learned in school the subjects you learned better were the subjects you liked start liking rc rc will also like start liking you back that's what i want to tell you now the question is how do you suddenly start liking rc the key is the motivation has to come from somewhere understand that rc is super important to your gmat you cannot do well on the gmat without doing decently in rc it's a killer especially rc you have three or four questions on the trot imagine that you didn't comprehend a particular passage well in sequence you may mess up a lot of questions that's enough to kill your gmat if you're not careful so start taking rc seriously that's where your motivation should come from the point i want to make is i will help you address a lot of these problems i'm going to prove to you that topic really doesn't matter i'm going to show you that length doesn't matter i'm going to specifically show you that show you how to deal with unfamiliar words and how to break down complex sentences i'm going to show you this now at having addressed all this what i want you to bring to the table in this session is forget about topic forget about any negative feeling you have about rc get immersed in the passage you read that first line or you read even that first first four words immerse in the topic go in with this mindset that yes in these four minutes or five minutes i'm going to read this rc passage let's learn something interesting don't care about what the topic is let's learn go in with that mindset you immerse yourself in the passage free of any distractions you will start picking up things which you otherwise don't pick up you will start figuring out what the author is really trying to do i guarantee that you'll be better off okay so i hope this piece is clear let's hear a quick yes no is the is this point about attitude coming through in essence start loving rc rc will love you back keep that in mind okay so let's talk about the three strategies that we are going to learn today number 1 how do you really deal with those long convoluted complex sentences you need to be able to break those down at a granular level you need to draw inferences you need to think about what you're reading not just reading not just you know just reading and then you have to assimilate all that into a whole so we want to discuss how we're going to do that you're going to throw out this entire session that's one something you really want to see the second piece you're going to see is something called keywords now this is a strategy that works beautifully on the gmat now what do i mean by keywords there are certain words or phrases that you will see in pretty much every typical gmat rc passage now these words a lot of us read this without focusing on that if you start focusing on these words if you start wondering okay what does this word mean why is it here what is the author trying to achieve by putting it here if you start asking those questions you're going to understand the author's intent even without reading what follows you in a lot of cases you'll be able to predict so here is a very quick example for you this is your first exercise of the day uh let me bring in this one example question for you on the screen you should see this particular question right um work from home has improved employee productivity however just think about that word however tell me what should logically follow what is the author trying to do i love the fact that there is not one person here who is not able to tell me and who is not who is giving me a wrong answer here all of you are right right some kind of a counter point about work from home i told you something positive about work from home maybe something not so great about work from home will follow some contrast some counter point something negative about work from home all of you are correct notice that irrespective of what follows you don't maybe maybe the sentence that follows is a very nightmarishly complex sentence even if that was very difficult to understand because you focused on however because you focused on that word you understand what the author is trying to do isn't that improving your comprehension just the fact that you focused on that word now the sentence that follows could be as simple as you know however work from home has increased employee stress or it could be some huge monologue huge sentence which is hard to decipher also it doesn't matter but you still understand the author's intent start looking at these words start focusing on these words pick up things that you otherwise miss the third the third strategy that i want to bring to your attention is uh the the, the skill of summarization and this especially is important when you're dealing with supremely dense nasty looking passages where you tend to get lost i'm sure a lot of us are in that zone where 
there are some passages where by the time we read the passage we have this feeling okay what did i just read i'm sure you have faced that right in those kinds of passages especially this important skill that will help you is your ability to summarize now let's say this is one section of the passage this is the next section of the passage this is another section of the passage and let's say whatever was presented here was very very informationally dense your mind there was a point of information overload and you went like okay what the hell did i just read the mistake all of us a lot of us make is we just blindly rush through the next set hoping that we'll catch it what you need to do is you realize that this point was a point of information overload it doesn't feel that i have retained it in my brain my brain is not you know it's not storing this information yet try to summarize it or abstract it in your own words in a simple way that you can remember you may or may not be able to do it every time but the more you're able to do it the more your brain will be able to process what follows because these passages are extremely well connected if you understand the preceding you will be have a better chance of understanding what follows so everybody clear on what summarization is and you're going to see examples anyway because that's what the whole session is about you're going to see all of these three things in action all right now i'm the word slowly is important this is a skill building session i'm I, i don't want to put any kind of undue time pressure on you the point is to go slow read slow let's see what you do are we ready for the first question of the day good good to go i like that so the problem i face in summarization is that i miss some context don't worry you will see how we do the summarization here and that should help you a little bit and then the, it's a muscle it's also a muscle to it's it's also a skill to build it's a muscle right so you'll see how we do it hopefully it should help you a little bit more so let me bring in the question for the poll for this passage so just one simple rule for all of these questions before you start the question that is right now just hit that button called still solving this way the batch is going to time itself so as you choose one of the option choices a b or c or d i will know when i can give you a warning saying okay last 10 seconds last 15 seconds based on the batch this is better than me putting undue time pressure on you you know that may not work the we need to it has to be tailored as per the batch so those of you who are here who are actively participating which you should be hit that still solving let's start with this particular passage just read the passage and what i'll do is just before you get into that what i'll do is very simple i am going to bring in this particular poll called done reading the passage once a significant number of you are done reading the passage that is my uh, cue to bring in the question okay let's read the passage All right I see that a lot of you are done reading the passage so I'm going to introduce the question now now I understand that some of us may want to refer to the passage while you know all this is happening while you're solving it so uh, I have just brought in the passage as well for those of you who need the passage so here's the question all the best it's a main point question most of you are done let's take another 10 seconds
nastri all right so those of you who are still in still solving take your best guess it's a good time to make your best shot all right let's end this poll good job so let's hear from you how did you find this particular passage so let me just bring back your poll let's yeah there it is and let me clear the answers how did you find this passage you can discuss the question later but let's talk about the passage i like the word interesting which is in the right direction for me confusing wordy difficult passage went tangentially too many words easy to read have to read multiple times to understand wouldn't let me concentrate on the point so i think you guys can see a quick summary of what's happening for a lot of us this was not that uh, easy right i can see tough as i haven't read about ethnocentrism before so what if i tell you that all of this you know the fact that you this is an unfamiliar topic does not matter at all so now this is where you have to pay attention to me make sure that you see how we go about cracking a passage like this okay the principles are important so i have a i have a lot of faith in this batch i'm sure that if i ask the right questions the batch you guys who are answering on my questions you guys will give me the right answers i'm sure i'll find the right answers here so let's see let's see how that goes okay so let's start reading the passage bordering on the extreme one definition meanwhile let me just take this away we can come back to this later what we would need is this i'll bring the question and the answers again don't worry about that all right so let's focus bordering on the extreme one definition of ethnocentrism considers it a schismatic in group slash out group differentiation in which okay this keeps going on i'm going to break this down because i need to be able to process information in chunks because otherwise it's too wordy right so bordering on the extreme one definition of ethnocentrism let's kind of put a break here now let me ask you a question bordering on the extreme one definition of ethnocentrism so the author by author i mean the person who's written this rc passage the author is clearly telling us that something is bordering on the extreme what is it that's bordering on the extreme this is a thought process that should happen in your brain as well so this there is some definition being referred to here right so this one definition is referring to some definition right so clearly the author is making an opinion on this definition that hey this definition it's a little extreme it's bordering on the extreme the second question for you what is the meaning of bordering on the extreme what does it really mean what is the author's emotion there what is he trying to say so that one definition as per the author it's a little extreme but what does it mean when you say it's it's a bit extreme he is being critical there you're right he doesn't approve of it also correct somewhat not widely accepted okay i like that answer too biased you see all these answers coming in right so it's a little extreme it's a little out there it's not the you know it's not the proper definition that should be there it's a little exaggerated do you guys see that it's not the thing that would be accepted it's kind of at that border where you know it, yeah i don't know if i'll accept this definition the author clearly has a problem it's a bit extreme it's a little exaggerated do you guys see that now now the question i have for you and this is where your self reflection begins how many of you figured this out earlier how many of you are just figuring this out now that the author is telling you that this definition is a little exaggerated and yes this is where your learning comes for those of you who figured it out earlier that's the right way of comprehending for those of you who are figuring it out now what you did earlier was reading you were reading the passage you were not comprehending the passage and that is a difference okay now let's carry on so bordering on the extreme there is this one definition of ethnocentrism so as per the author this particular definition it's a little extreme now this one definition for me is like a keyword it tells me something very important what can you infer from one definition why is the author using one definition why not my definition the definition there's something happening here right yes multiple definitions so clearly this particular definition the author does not agree with it's a little exaggerated and there are 
definitely multiple definitions that exist another thing you can say is the author is creating a distance between himself and herself and this particular definition bus there is this is not the definition this is not you know my definition there is this one definition there is a distance being created so two inferences there one definition not necessarily the author's definition in fact the author has commented saying this is a little exaggerated and second multiple definitions so within those first eight words there is so many points that you extracted now this is the difference between reading and comprehending right so bordering on the extreme there is a certain definition there is this one definition of ethnocentrism which is as per the author it's exaggerated now let's continue so this particular definition of ethnocentrism considers it whenever you see it them they all these pronouns always ask what are they referring to it means ethnocentrism here so there is this one definition of ethnocentrism which considers ethnocentrism to be a schismatic in group slash out group differentiation now let's think about this for a second uh anybody how, how many of you are really familiar with what schismatic is uh let's ask that question how many of you are seeing this word for the first time so fantastic uh, i have also intentionally stayed away from uh, you know you know googling the meaning of this word let's assume that we don't know the meaning of this word let's ignore this word for now and the point i want, want to make is the gmat is not meant to be a test of vocabulary if if there is a complex word right we can try to infer the meaning if we can't let's move on let's hold on to it so there is this one definition of ethnocentrism it's a little out there it's a little exaggerated and as per the author this particular definition considers ethnocentrism to be some kind of a in group out group differentiation so can i say it's some it's pointing to some kind of a difference between an in group and an out group we don't at this point know clearly what these groups mean but there is some difference between in group and out group that's what is being highlighted here everyone with me so far so this particular definition considers it to be some kind of a difference between an in group and an out group whatever those groups mean in which now in which is also a keyword the minute i see in which i know that i'm going to see a description of that right this what what kind of difference are we talking about in which internal cohesion relative peace solidarity loyalty and devotion to the in group now this is a lot of text the point if you remember the point i made earlier you need a way to keep this in your brain you cannot mug up all these words you cannot by heart and remember all these words that's not the point of gmat you need a way to remember this and keep it in your brain this is where you use the skill of summarization so if i told you cohesion peace solidarity loyalty all these things towards the in group to the in group if you had to put it in your own words how would you do that let's hear from the group just express that in your own way positive emotions positive feeling great those are very good answers some positive feeling towards the group right notice the word to so some positive feeling you're talking about like love some positive feeling towards the in group and what you did right now is summarization okay so now let's carry on so we are talking about some kind of a difference between in group and out group where positive feelings like you know love and loyalty towards the in group are correlated with it's a beautiful keyword which i'm introducing you to what does it mean when i say x is correlated to y it has a specific meaning right when x is correlated to y connected there is some relationship there absolutely that is the exact words that you're looking for right so there is some connection there so positive feeling towards the in group is somehow related with a state of hostility now what is hostility negative feeling or hate towards out group so this entire complex piece here it's very simple actually positive feeling towards in group is somehow connected to a negative feeling towards the out group that's it. it's written in a very complex way but that's all we are looking at now let's move on so state of hostility towards out groups which are often perceived and yet again like i told you you see this word which ask the question what is it referring to out groups these out groups are perceived as subhuman now this word is also a clue the minute you see the word subhuman even if 
you don't have any context to this topic you have no idea what ethnocentrism is about right you know that here we are talking about groups of people you're not talking about groups of potatoes or tomatoes because people are being considered as subhuman here so even if you did not have any context to this topic you can actually figure this out so hostility towards out groups these out groups are being considered or perceived as subhuman and evil in essence summarizing everything we have done so far you would have got all these points and this is all the points that we have discussed right so essentially the author introduced us to a certain definition of ethnocentrism the author very, very clear cut gave you an opinion on the definition that was it's a little extreme it's a little out there exaggerated then what exactly does that definition say positive feeling or love towards your in groups is correlated with or somehow linked with a negative feeling towards the outside group that's it these outside groups are practically considered subhuman or evil so this is the entire passage comprehended in a nutshell a uh, very quick question for you how many of you were not able to get all these points let me bring in a poll for that so you see these three points here let's kind of understand how this batch did how did we did as a group if there is a point out of these three with that you are not able to understand make sure you register that and i can see that some of us were clearly able to get all these points for those of us congrats this is what comprehension really means and this is the difference between reading and actually comprehending there are so many points that had to be extracted this was what you need to extract and for those of us who missed out on one or the other here you have very very granular feedback on what you missed now for example uh if you didn't focus on one definition you may not realize that you know this is there are many other definitions there are at least one more definition and the, this is not necessarily the author's definition you wouldn't pick up on that if you didn't focus on this keyword if you just read that without thinking about what one definition means you would falter there if you were not able to figure out and this was the case with quite a few of us right if you are not able to figure out that hey this particular definition as per the author is exaggerated that means you just read bordering on the extreme without processing what it really meant you didn't draw that inference right and for those of you who got lost in this seemingly complex not seemingly complex actually complex uh, you know interplay of words that means you were not able to abstract the core thought you need to to summarization right so how does this feel do you get a sense of how comprehension actually works how we are supposed to be comprehending and the difference between that and simply reading the passage yeah i meant on your own yeah good now let's use this information remember i told you it's not just important to extract all this information you should be able to use it to answer the questions so first let me make sure that the results are visible so that we can see how the batch performed now um option d is actually the right answer and you know 43% of us were able to get it which is great um uh, with the next questions let's see how we do but let's kind of understand why each answer is correct or incorrect okay and that should help so this is also the point where we also get a sense of how answer choice analysis was how granular it should be uh, we will be sharing the pdf with you all these points that are highlighted in red make the choice incorrect so make sure you focus on those when you go through this okay so what is the main purpose of the author behind writing this particular paragraph is it to criticize a concept that encourages hostility towards people not belonging to the same group the author clearly has criticized that one definition of ethnocentrism but has the author criticized ethnocentrism itself has the author done any criticism of ethnocentrism that's the first question you should ask has the author you know criticized ethnocentrism itself or maximum the author has done is criticize that one particular definition by calling it exaggerated the author has not criticized the concept itself that's your first reason to reject the second reason to reject this particular choice is does the passage tell you or even imply anywhere that ethnocentrism is encouraging hostility towards people belonging to out, out to the out group all i know is 
positive feeling or love towards the in group is correlated with negative feeling or hate towards the out group is it mentioned or is it implied that ethnocentrism is what is encouraging this hostility also not mentioned right so two reasons why you should reject option a outright now let's talk about one of the more popular answer choices which is option b now here again it's very important to understand what some of these terms mean what does it mean when you say to evaluate something and for those of you who are you know getting into gmat rc for the first time this again is a learning point right to evaluate something means to assess assess something an evaluation fundamentally is an assessment so for example i want to assess the use of chat gpt for you know creating content how would i do that i would see what are the pros if i use chat gpt to create content what are the good things that can come out of it that's one side what are the bad things that can come out of it that's the other side this aspect this this activity of looking at the positives and the negatives the pros and the cons of using chat gpt to create my content that is what is called as an assessment or an evaluation now tell me and based on that assessment i might make a judgment either to use chat gpt or not use chat gpt now tell me has the author evaluated ethnocentrism here with this understanding clear cut no the other the other aspect is and this is where this i know that some of you were confused about this uh, you assume that a lot of those things that were given solidarity peace loyalty those were all the features no those were not features those were attitude to the group that word to in the passage is very important you know attitude towards the group is not the same as features of the group here we are not we are only given a definition we are not talking about features at all so that's another reason to reject this one so a and b done let's quickly look at c as well now this is very easy to reject if your brain had focused on that keyword called one definition has the author defined ethnocentrism the author is provided a certain definition but has the author defined it himself or herself or themselves exactly this part is wrong asses the second part is also sketchy you know you know the word hierarchy is interesting it's kind of difficult to infer if there is any hierarchy here definitely you know one group is being hated that we know does it imply a hierarchy that's something to debate even if even if you say there is a hierarchy there probably not there even if you say there's a hierarchy just like just like with option a do we know that ethnocentrism is what is leading to this supposed hierarchy yet again nothing about this is given in the passage we cannot say this as well so option c was very popular so i hope for those of you who did not get it a little bit of clarity is coming through at this point and i also hope that you know you see how granular answer choice analysis actually is now let's talk about the one answer that actually works in this particular question to introduce the concept of ethnocentrism by presenting a certain view on it by presenting a view on it now what has the author done through this passage the author has introduced us the readers to something called ethnocentrism there is this thing called ethnocentrism through this passage we have been introduced to this particular entity by and how has the author done it not by presenting the proper definition he's given us an exaggerated definition but by presenting that definition the author has achieved the purpose of introducing us to this particular topic so do you guys see how option d is the only choice that works and hopefully this gives you a little bit of clarity good so this is where this this reflection is very very important now we've analyzed this one passage in detail but let's figure out why did you make mistakes and this is something that's important to understand now typically the mistake can happen in this phase you did not read the passage as well as you should have so you rushed through the passage uh, you know for example you looked at that that starting point right bordering on the extreme but you didn't process it you did not understand what it really meant that's an example did not read the passage properly you read quickly but you didn't properly understand what's happening there that visualization of that information was not happening those inferences were not being drawn you didn't notice the keywords and understand what those words implied you didn't summarize is this what happened to you or were you able to figure this out but you struggled in the answer choice analysis you understood all these aspects but when it came to answer choice analysis you weren't reading the answer choices with the kind of rigor that you actually need what is this answer choice exactly telling us does it satisfy 
what this question needs that analysis did that happen or is that the reason why you faltered or and in some cases this may not be the case with this question but with some questions especially in rc there are always traps in the question stem so is there something in the question stem that you know stumped you so let me know for those of you who were not able to get d who are not confident about the correct answer what was the point where did you what where did you miss this particular point before we move to the next question i was lost in all the new words that the passage had but i hope you see now that a lot of those words do not matter second reason for some of us good so the point i want to make is uh, wherever you're preparing from how are you preparing in rc this aspect of reflecting on your mistakes is an important thing that's how you actually learn make sure you do that for every single passage and every single question that you do because that's where you learn what is your problem what is it you need to fix keep this in mind okay now are we ready for the next question but before that i will kind of summarize our learning some of our learnings from this particular point now what is it that you actually need to do gmat rc well notice how we didn't bother about ethnocentrism we didn't go into this more that oh i don't know anything about this topic those things do not matter one bit we immersed ourselves into the passage 100% without any distraction without worrying about whether this topic is something i like i don't like i'm comfortable with nothing 100% immersion you are able to do it the second thing that really helped is the strategies that we talked about this entire passage mini passage was just one long sentence if you had read it like a story book if you had read it in one sequence very very difficult to extract all these points but when you break this down you will be able to understand things also on keywords even a word one definition told us something in which told us something by focusing on keywords you can understand the author's intent and of course we saw summarization at work now another important aspect here is what do you not need to sg mat rc you really don't need to be an english scholar right you don't need to be very very scholarly with your english you don't need shakespearean levels of english still i do not know the meaning of this word schismatic did it make any difference you can think about that we still don't know what this word means for most of us second point we do not need to be a subject matter expert in the, the particular topic gmat is meant to be taken by people of all backgrounds the information in the passage is absolutely sufficient for us to answer the questions that follow you do not need to know about ethnocentrism how many of us actually come from a background where we know these terms let's hear that most of us i understand would not be from this background at all did it matter does it matter absolutely not there is a point in rc where once you build your skills to the right point you can be truly topic agnostic of course some topics will always be a bit more comfortable but it wouldn't matter at all and that's where we need to be all right so think about this reflection point as well uh, i hope this entire thing was helpful are we ready for the next question meanwhile i'm going to bring in the poll so the process remains the same uh, let's once you're done reading the passage just make sure you click done reading the passage that way i know to move on
All right, so many of you are done reading the passage. So I am going to ensure that for those of you who need the passage, it will always be here. Let me bring in the passage. So the passage is available at your bottom in case at the bottom of the screen, in case you need a reference. Here's the poll. Let's again hit that still solving everybody. So that, you know, the batch can time itself that way. All right, let's I'm waiting for a few more of you. All right, so here is your question. This time it's an inference question. All the best. Most of you are done. Let's take another 10 seconds before we start discussing this one. Last five seconds. Three, two, one, and take your best guess. Come on, folks. We're still in still solve. Let's. Try to take a best guess before we move on. All right. Good job. Very interesting. I'm going to broadcast the results here. Take a look. Um, B and E are the clear candidates here, but only one of them is right. And uh, I'm sure by the within the next 10, 15 minutes, you should have absolute clarity on why one of them is the right answer. All right. Let's right. We'll, we'll come back to this in a while. Meanwhile, let's hear your thoughts on this particular passage how did you find this passage uh, you know you can also compare with the previous one did you find it easier more difficult were you able to apply some of the things that we discussed so let's talk about all those aspects let's hear what you have to say still complicated of course a bit easier hard lot of words horrible difficult very complex better than the first one okay bit easy by applying the things Good example to understand inference based question. Oh, absolutely. That, that's one of the reasons we have it here. It's, it's very high on learning. EC ones I knew how to read. Oh, fantastic. Let's see. So this is a question where uh, I'm pretty sure that at least some of us in this batch definitely pulled out all the aspects, but still might have chosen a different answer. And the key there is to understand what GMAT RC inferences are. Uh, and so we'll have a discussion on that as well. But first, let's get to this particular passage. So I do see that for a lot of us, this was a difficult passage. And yes, this is still a difficult passage. There's no, no, there's no two ways about it. For most of us, this would be a difficult passage. But again, what you're going to see is how even a passage that looks like this can be cracked. So again, pay attention. This is where we go through each and every nut and bolt of this passage and understand what's happening. But first, there's a certain detour that I want to take. And to do that, let me bring another poll. So this is a worthwhile detour, I promise you. Let's uh, have this particular poll come in. So very simple question for you. Now imagine that I am the author. So when I say author of the RC passage, in this case, this is me, right? And I give you the statement. I tell to you the color blue is considered to have a soothing effect on the moods of people. The question is which of the following statements, which are the statements that you see there are inferable from the statement given. So let's kind of register our responses for this one too.
all right so let me broadcast the results because uh, the I, the trend is very very clear um, around 65% of us do believe that only statement 1 is valid and uh, which means around 35 36% of us believe that only 2 is valid or both are valid 65% of us you guys are absolutely spot on this is an important point for the rest of us to understand the point is if i tell you that the color blue is considered to have a soothing effect on the moods of people what can you really be sure about based on that all i can be sure about is that hey there's definitely a group of people which exists which considers blue to have a soothing effect on the moods of people there are definitely it could be a big group it could be a tiny group but end of the day there is this consideration that exists in the universe that blue has a soothing effect on the moods of people this you can definitely say because otherwise the author would not be able to say i would not be able to say that hey the color blue is considered to have soothing effect somebody has to be there to do this consideration the question you have to ask is are you 100% sure that i i being the author belong to this group do i definitely have do, do i definitely believe that blue is considered to have a soothing effect can you be 100% sure about it the important point being the word 100% sure and yes all the few who are saying no you are absolutely right you cannot be 100% sure that me the author also belongs to this bucket so definitely there is this consideration that blue has a soothing effect on the moods of people but just based on this statement i am not 100% sure the author agrees with this which means that is not a valid inference i can only infer that some people regard the color blue as soothing i cannot consider i cannot take it as a fact that the color blue is soothing now this is an important point because it indicates what i like to call author centricity of gmat rc inferences the author is the king or queen when you are uh, when you see a question in inf- when you see an inference question which says hey what can you infer from the passage it's essentially asking you what do you know with 100% certainty to be something that the author agrees with keep this in mind we are going to come back to this as we get into the main discussion but imagine now that i wanted i am the author i wanted to communicate to you that yes the color blue is soothing how would i do it very simple this statement me being the author this statement is me telling you the reader as a fact hey boss the color blue has a soothing effect on the moods of people here you are 100% sure that the author believes this this is a valid inference on the gmat okay so the key, the key point is this author centricity aspect what is it based on the information given what is it that you know with 100% certainty the author believes to be true everybody clear with this particular point especially for those of us who were not clear about this earlier it's very important we will come back to this all right good to see that now with this detour let's come back to the passage because now it's going to get interesting now there's a very very sneaky little keyword here which i draw your attention to at this point for those of you who noticed this and understood the implication of what this means you guys would not have chosen option b which is not right so here let's look at the passage ethnocentrism let's call it ec for short right ethnocentrism and its canonical variants now uh, anybody here who does not know the meaning of the word canonical so let's ignore this word for now if it's important we'll be able to figure it out else let's just move on so ethnocentrism and its variants okay let's ignore that word you will always find words which are unfamiliar but that doesn't mean you you know freak out feel free not to worry about it so ethnocentrism and its you know variants are deemed to be intimately connected with xenophobia let's call xenophobia xp now what is deemed to be telling you with the understanding that you developed from the color blue example what is it that this is screaming at you it's a considered opinion in other words you are not 100 you are not 100% sure the author agrees with this if you say this is the author's opinion you are going in the other direction right it's you are not 100% sure the author agrees with it so there is definitely some group of people who consider ethnocentrism and xenophobia to be intimately connected 
but you're not 100% sure whether the author agrees with this that's the point right it's a considered opinion it it's like ethnocentrism and its variants are considered to be intimately connected okay so the consideration exists are you sure the author agrees with it everybody clear on this this is very very important because this is the difference between choosing choice b and not choosing choice b and choice b was the most popular choice right all right good i see i i, I can see that a lot of us have got this now now let's move on so ethnocentrism and its variants are considered to be intimately connected with xenophobia the inference i draw here thanks to deem to be the keyword is this is not necessarily the author's opinion i'm not 100% sure whether the author also believes this okay now let's move on xenophobia comma a complex attitude system okay complex attitude system come sentiment structure okay involving aversion or dislike so it's got some kind of an attitude that involves you know hate or dislike and antagonism which again is hate or dislike vis a vis the stranger or the alien so with regard to the alien and everything that the stranger or alien represents wow once i read this i realized that my brain entered the zone of information overload how is it that i can keep this in my brain this is a very complex definition right something is given about xenophobia it's very complex to keep this in mind so if you had to put put it in a way that you can keep this in your brain you have to summarize it you have to abstract the essence of it how would you do that what is your summarization of this entire complex attitude all the way till alien represents go a little beyond negative words hate towards the outsider fantastic definition hate towards the outsider is xenophobia does not like the foreign absolutely see you guys are doing this it's essentially that negative feeling or hate towards the alien or the strange the point is if you're doing this while you're in the passage your understanding of the passage is far superior to otherwise you would understand what is happening here before you do other things so everybody is clear what this entire thing means it's some kind of hatred or you know dislike towards the stranger or the strange so far so good now here is a question for you is this it seems like a definition but is this a definition the author agrees with let's talk about that because i sense that this would be a place where some of us might have some confusion can you be 100% sure the author agrees with this that's the question i have so you see this entire description of xenophobia you know you summarized it beautifully as hatred for aliens but is it something the author agrees with so i see a lot of noes i see a lot of uh, we don't know and i see a few yeses also so this is clearly something that requires a certain level of deliberation so let's take a simple example to understand this and then i think you can tell me the answer to this question so the screen is visible you guys should be able to see this right google an internet company is considered a good buy right now the question is uh, this a should be in small let's just make that change yeah so google an internet company is considered a good buy the question i have for you is uh, whether google is a good buy or not we don't know we don't know if the author agrees with it. it's consideration right but what about google being called an internet company is that something the author agrees with what would you say yes right in essence what is the author doing he or she or they are just giving you extra information for you fyi for your information this is what google is google by the way for your information is an internet company it's considered a good buy this internet company an internet company is the author giving you additional information for your benefit about google it is intended as a fact it's given to you as a fact in other words this is something the author is giving to you there is no doubt about whether they agree with it right so the question is very very similar look at the way this sentence is written xenophobia comma and then you have this entire definition isn't this the author giving you the definition of xenophobia for our benefit our being the readers as a fact boss this is what is xenophobia take it from me that is what the author is doing here right exactly so the way the sentence is worded is very important right if the author wanted to indicate that hey, this not be this may not be my definition they would have put it in a different way see ethnocentrism is deemed to be intimately connected with xenophobia which is considered to be a complex attitude 
which has been uh, defined by many people as a complex attitude when when is written that way there is a certain doubt about whether the author agrees with that here xenophobia comma this is what it is take it and go that's as simple as that so i hope this point is clear this is the author defining xenophobia for us pure fact okay now let's move on let's summarize take a step back and see what we have so far so ec and its variants are considered to be intimately connected with xenophobia not sure the author agrees with this what is xenophobia hatred towards the alien or the strange great now let's move on some socio cultural anthropologists again notice how this means not necessarily the author somebody else's view some socio cultural anthropologists even considered xenophobia and ethnocentrism opposite sides of the same coin now there is a beautiful thing that's happening here and for those of you who got confused by opposite sides of the same coin and like okay what does this you know what does this phrasing mean what is this idiom or whatever it is what does it mean the key to understand this is this beautiful keyword that's here if you understand what even is doing here you crack the passage open so can somebody tell me what is even doing here what is the author trying to say through this one word called even what does it do what does it do what does it do i see some of us have got it extreme is view representation extreme view you stressing the point those answers are right but i can see that some of us do not see this is happen see what's happening here so let me give an example to give us absolute clarity on this as well and uh, for those of you who like basketball this is a basketball example so i hope the screen is visible i hope the note is visible michael jordan was the most dominant basketball player of his time some analysts even consider him to be the most dominant player of all time you see what that even is doing here already there is a statement that has been made about jordan that hey this guy was the greatest player of his era of his time that even is taking that point to that next level it's taking it to a higher extreme right already you know he was the most dominant player of his time but then some people come and tell me that boss he is the best of all time he's the greatest of all time so even is emphasizing that dominance aspect of jordan taking it to the next taking it to an extreme that is what even is doing everybody clear on this this is making sense now and again reflect on your reading of the passage did you figure out what this even was doing there when you read this or is this light getting turned on now that, because that's where you are missing out on layers of comprehension by not focusing on keywords and thinking about what those keywords are adding to the story good tube light indeed that's that's a nice way of putting it so there it is so to understand what even is doing here i saw this keyword and i asked okay why is the author putting this one this particular word here and then i realized oh ethnocentrism is considered to be so what is essentially happening is hey ethnocentrism is considered to be intimately connected with xenophobia so some connection exists as per some people at least now it's being taken to that next level through even some anthropologists socio cultural anthropologists say that boss they are not just intimately connected that connection is beyond intimate it's an even stronger connection and i can figure this out even before i read opposite sides of the same coin for those of you who are confused by opposite sides of the same coin now you know what it means the sides may be opposite but it's the same coin if you have a coin if you have a heads you will also have a tails crudely put the back side of one is the front side of the other they are so strongly connected you cannot have one without the other or in other words they coexist you cannot have ethnocentrism without xenophobia you cannot have xenophobia without ethnocentrism the connection is that strong that is what opposite sides of the same coin means right i like the chat gpt example there is right so they may be opposite sides but they are opposite sides of the same damn coin in other words the author is telling you that these two things they may be opposite in some level but they are so strongly connected so now i hope you guys see what's happening so there is this consideration that ec and xp are intimately connected these anthropologists are coming in and telling you boss they are not just intimately connected the connection is even beyond intimate connection very strong connection now let's move on but but is like however 
the minute you see but i need that i know that there is a contrast coming the, some kind of a like however you are going in the other direction so xenophobic the connection being implied here is beyond intimate by these anthropologists but a few voices have cautioned that this need not be the case so these few voices are saying oh boss it's not that strong a connection also hold your horses that's it so i hope now the passage is clear and you're seeing how using keywords using summarization drawing inferences reading in pieces all these elements all these principles will give you better comprehension so if you read this particular passage if you understood all these points these are the points that you would ideally have taken out let's do a quick check just to see if all of us got this uh let me bring in the poll for this uh okay yeah which parts were you not able to understand so if there's something you were not able to understand make sure that's registered let's highlight that out of all these five points right the author has given you the definition of xp as a fact then there are these people who consider ec and xp to be intimately connected what is xp that's given to you hatred for the stranger the alien some anthropologists believe that the connection is very very strong beyond intimate to the point of you cannot have one without the other then these other voices some other people say it's not that strong a connection so many elements in this one teeny tiny paragraph so i i i i can see that a lot of us did get a lot of these points correct but i would also i can also see that in terms of how many people got the final answer right it's still not the same so there is something going on there and that has to do with the definition of inference right so is this clear is the passage clear do you guys see the value of the methods that we are discussing looking at keywords drawing those inferences making those summaries that is important all right good now let's talk about a very important element as far as uh, gmat inferences are concerned let's understand what exactly is a correct inference on the gmat so first thing is it's something we already discussed the author centricity of gmat rc when the question tells you based on the passage you know which of these is a valid inference which of these can be inferred from the passage we are asking the question based on the information in the passage what is it that you can be 100% sure that the author agrees with if it's something that you don't know the author agrees with not the right answer that point very very important the second point i want to bring to your attention is this the author of the your gmat rc passage is assumed to be a sane and logical person what does a sane logical person not do they do not dispute facts you i might dispute you on your opinion i will never dispute you on something that is factual so if the author gave you something as a fact by definition the author agrees with it you cannot ask the question how do you know the author agrees with the fact no the author is assumed to be logical now put two, two things together now the correct answer shows itself b is not the correct answer i can see the question which option is correct the choice e is actually correct and here is another important point about gmat rc a lot of us have this idea that you know uh, when you talk about an inference it cannot be existing information there is some information given in the passage and inference is some new point that you logically deduce now in most cases this is what happens with inference but it's not always necessarily the case sometimes sometimes you would see in gmat rc you would see some existing information being represented as an answer choice a restatement of given information and that as far as gmat rc is concerned is considered to be a valid inference i'll repeat this don't go in with this mindset that the inference the valid inference can only be some new point that is not mentioned anywhere in the passage no once in a while you can also have an inference a valid inference coming out from an existing fact from the passage so if there is something in the passage which you are 100% sure the author agrees with if that option gets restated and presented as an answer choice do not reject that choice it is a valid inference is this clear because some of you got everything right but might have still rejected choice c for this one reason okay good now if you have this level of clarity on the passage 
what you are going to see is rejecting the incorrect choices you will not take more than 4 seconds or 5 seconds let's do answer choice analysis and you'll see the value of analyzing the passage this way so which of these is a valid inference based on the passage that's our question option a xenophobia and ethnocentrism are different facets of the same concept or in other words different faces of the same coin opposite sides of the same coin this is not something that you know with 100% certainty the author agrees with this is the socio cultural anthropologist view so i don't know if the author agrees with it so it cannot be a valid inference let's move to option b option b was more popular than the correct answer but now with our understanding of what deemed to be really means are you 100% sure that ec and xp are intimately connected i am not 100% sure the author agrees with that and therefore it's not the valid answer do for those of you who chose choice b is this clear now that deemed to be is that one thing that immediately makes that choice incorrect rejecting a choice b is a 5 second affair everybody clear on this i think i saw a few yeses coming in but yeah good now let's talk about option c uh, most of us did not choose option c uh, some of us did not choose option c because you thought they it is connected these two entities are connected the real logic is you don't know for sure whether as per the author they are connected no idea therefore no option d i'm happy to choose uh, i'm happy to see that most of us did not choose this but for those of you who chose this where do you see causality do you see anything in the passage that indicates that xp is causing ethnocentrism or even the other way ethnocentrism causing you know xenophobia you don't see that at all right so where are you inferring causality from is something you need to ask in your reflection right which brings us to the only statement in this entire set of choices you know with certainty the author agrees with why do you know that the author agrees with this this was given to us as a fact as the definition of xenophobia so there is no doubt about this being the correct answer it's as simple as that so i hope this was helpful again go back to this process of reflection it's not we are not here only to solve questions that's not the point learn think about why is it that if you made a mistake where did you falter go back think in this case what happened did you not read the passage did you get all those four aspects right else there's a problem here did you mess up in answer choice analysis there might be a problem here and again question stem i think now you have absolute clarity on what inference is looking for next time this would never be a problem with the passage that follows you would see places where if you don't properly visualize the question stem see what the question stem is telling you there there can be trouble so make sure that you do this with that again i want to quickly summarize everything we've learned again notice that i don't care about what the topic is in those 4 5 minutes which i'm spending on reading this passage whatever time i take 100% emotion don't care whether this topic is known this topic is unknown and i don't want you guys to do that also okay now read the passage slowly don't skim break down those sentences make those connections you see a word like even one keyword called even if you ask the question what is it doing there the kind of understanding that you can get out of it is fantastic that will help you solve a question like this in no time you saw how much time we took in processing these answer choices why because we had a death grip on the passage that is the point all right with that uh, i'm going to hand over uh, the session to rajat rajat will take you through a full length official passage and uh, i'm sure you guys are going to learn a lot uh, over to you rajat thanks everyone that's my time thank you arsha i think uh, you're doing such a fantastic job i thought why not let you continue but uh, but how how is it that uh, we're doing right now i i saw some excellent questions come in the q and a part so i also want to thank you guys for for those questions um it was really really good to see those i think one of the, the, the what what these questions tell us is that uh, you are thinking while uh, while 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 learning and, and that i think is, is is a really important trait uh, overall so um, so so yeah so really glad that that we did that now there are two questions that i want to address um, that i saw in the q and a part that i think might apply to a few other folks as well um one was about 
is CR inference the same as RC inference? Yes, inference is inference. Whether it's in the context of CR or RC doesn't matter. Um, it always remains the same. Uh, uh, the, the 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 second thing, which was uh, yeah, so I think that's something which is really really important. Um, so the way you approach inference is how you do it. It's just that in the context of CR, you have a about a, about a 70, 80 word passage R, so you're looking more at two, between 230 to about 400 words. So there's a lot more um, uh, uh, scanning that you need to do. You've got to, the processing required, sometimes there's a lot more. Um, the second piece which was there was, uh, I had this question to really say, hey, uh, Rajat, in the actual exam, will we have uh, the time to, to, to do such kind of processing? And, and the very simple answer is yes, you will. If you build that mental muscle, you will. Today, it, it seems inconceivable to you guys that you'd be able to do this uh, on the actual exam, but you will be able to do it on the actual exam, again, if you build that muscle. And, and building that muscle requires a very conscious effort, uh, an effort where you very, very deliberate, an effort where you're very, very slow, and where you focus on understanding rather than worrying about, hey, how is the clock ticking out there? Uh, and when you do that, you you you... you kind of build those neural connections where you when you see certain sentence structures uh, 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 such as deemed to be you automatically visualize them you don't take time to visualize them you don't reread really those parts and that's really important okay how many even like examples can we uh, can you learn oh, you'd be surprised I mean as you practice questions on in scholarium do questions in the course you 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 do it but the point really is um and, and I think hopefully Harsha's uh, been able to communicate that point. It's not about doing tens of questions or hundreds of questions that matter. What matters is how much can you extract out of one single passage and one single question. It's the amount of learning that you take away. Um, so, uh, so so that's something that that is there. Okay. Uh, so so what you'd find is you you answer you you go through ten to fifteen good passages. If you've done a thorough job, if you've made notes, if you've actually written, created your own error log, and you go back, revise that before the 16th passage, you're going to find there's very little new stuff that you're going to get out of it. Okay. With that, um, let me just, let's go through our full length passage. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give you about four minutes, four, four and a half minutes to read the passage. We'll have a yes, no poll over here. Once you've done reading the passage, um, you can, I want you guys to select yes. Okay, um, but before that, I want let's clear all answers. I want about forty of you to select no. First, forty of you should select no. So when when you guys have selected when 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 you get select yes, uh, I or rather about seventy percent of you select yes. I know that hey, you guys are done, and I will call time. So we have thirty-two of you selected no. Let's get to about forty of you select uh, to select no, and then that way you know you guys as a group will time you. Ah, 49 have selected. No, that's good. All right. With that, I'm going to mute myself. Here is the passage. I'm going to make it nice and big. Let's just... Hey, Siri. Put a timer for four minutes.
Okay, guys, so the poll is more visible, so you can change your responses as in when you see fit. All right, I think we have most of 70% of you actually have changed your, your no to yes. I want to get the other uh, folks to, to really also change, uh, toggle their answers. So uh, toggle their answer rather, so that we can move forward. All right, three, two, and one. So let's move forward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you questions. I'm going to hide this yes, no poll. Here is a question. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make have the passage be over here, reduce the size of it so you can scroll the passage. So uh, let's just make sure we have this over here. Just forgive me, guys. And I'm going to remove the Q&A pod for some time so that we have a bit more real estate over here. Okay. And thank you, those of you who are doing still solving. Uh, we will just simply go through this. Uh, Okay, 10 more seconds, get those answers in. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. I'm gonna broadcast the results. You can see how you guys did. Uh, with that, I'm gonna show the second question, but uh, before we do that, I think let's do the the still solving piece. I'm going to broadcast results. I want 35 people to say still solving, and then I'm going to show the second question. 35 people to say still solving. This is the poll for the second question. I have 30, 31, because if one person who's chosen choice D, uh, 33, 34, and then one more, 35. God, let me remove broadcast results. Here is your second question. Good luck, guys.
All right, about 70% of the class is done. Another 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast results. You guys can see how you guys did. Choices A and D were very popular. Um, and, and just the choices you make, it allows us to really um, make, draw inferences about, uh, uh, about, about how you're reading the passage, where your gaps exist, and what you should do as a corrective action. This is a 700-level pa passage, so it's not an easy passage. Let me get out the poll for the third question. Let's get, let's again do still solving, 35 people. And then make sure with every question, you read the question stem really well. Uh, I have 32 people, 33. Let's get to 35 very uh, quickly so that we can move on to the question. All right, good, thank you. Here is the question. About 70% of the group is done. Another 15 seconds. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. Broadcast the results. You guys can see um, uh, how we have polled. <coughs> let's go to our next poll question number four guys by this time you guys know the drill 35 people not answered are still solving i'm sorry um yes good thank you here is the next question Again, 80% of the class is done. Let's get those answers in. Three, two, 
and one let me end the poll and broadcast the results and, and i can see us getting better and better with every question i'm really happy to 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 see this let's get to our last question this one is a challenging one make sure you read the the, the right aspects of the passage very clearly but before that we're going to do same uh, still solving again i want to see 35 people say still solving good and here is your last question All right, about 80% of the class is done, actually. 90% is done. As, as I'm thinking. Let's get a few more responses. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast the results. This is how we, got, we polled. All right. So I'm going to hide this as well. Let's bring in the Q&A pod. Again, remember the Q&A part is for your questions and our answers. Uh, and the right-hand side is for my questions. So how, how, how is this passage and how is the, the process of, um, of, of answering questions here? Hard, moderate, OK. Let's get a few more responses. Complex. This is a 700-level passage in, in, with regards to, you know, passage plus questions. That's how we classify a passage. Some were reason others were challenging. Absolutely, that was the case, and the stats show that. Comprehension was moderate with, with few complex words. Um, I, I, and I'm glad you're making that comment because um, that's the value of uh, of, of of analyzing shorter passages to death that when you get such passages such as the one that's there that's here you you, you kind of uh, your brain's able to process them a lot e more easily okay <coughs> that's good when i has a question how many of us do you think read and claim to understand the passage on time um i don't know about on time let me just be very clear and i frankly don't care about it at this stage you know for me I, I start to care about timing towards stage two, probably towards stage three of learning. So middle of stage two is when I start to worry about timing, not before that. Um, I, I gave this example early on, uh, and I'm going to repeat this. You know, when you think about learning how to drive, um, you know, we don't care about how long do I take to make a turn. What I care about is am I going through the right sequence of 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 of, of things? Am I going through the checklist? Am I stopping at the stop sign? Am I looking around to make sure that no one's um, uh, uh, driving in the same direction when I'm making a right turn, no one's coming from from the left hand side. As long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm making sure that there's enough clearance, I'm okay because because you want your brain to make those connections right then and there. And and, and so that's the same thing for me. As long as you're reading and comprehending, 
even if you're taking longer. In fact, if you should take longer, just to be very clear, if you're not taking longer and you're comprehending to that level, then frankly, you shouldn't be in this class. You should be, there are better places where you can spend your time. Maybe there's another weakness that you can address. But if you are taking longer, you are in the right place, you are going through the right process of learning. And and which I think is, is really important for, 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 for you to know. Okay. So let's go through the passage. And uh, and, and this passage has, has beautiful... Uh, a set of keywords which which I want to make sure that we go through okay and 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 you'll see those keywords come in um so let's read this fnm assert that medical research could be improved by a move towards a larger uh, a larger simpler uh, trials of medical treatments okay so when you when you think about this uh, uh, you see the first word assert why is what what do you infer when you really just say when you see the word FNM assert? What's the first thing that should come to your mind? Okay. What else should come to your mind? Third is conclude. Yes. But the other thing that should come to your mind is is this the author who's asserting or is it someone else? It's someone else. It's it's uh, it's it's not the author. The author is simply presenting information here, um, right? And and that's really important. The author has chosen these words, and the author is a very careful person here. So, and and that's kind of I mean that's the kind of identification that we want you to do. Similar to what I talked about driving. Um, so the the two people F and M, M then they they're making an assertion. They said, hey, we can improve medical research by if we move towards larger trials, simpler clinical trials uh, of medical treatment. Okay, then you have another keyword over here, currently. Currently is really important. Why? Because it saves the current state of mind. It, 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 you should have a timeline in your mind when you think about currently. Currently, researchers collect far more background information um, uh, on patients than is strictly required for their trial. Far more. Again, a really important word over here, which means, again, and this is a statement written by the author. That's That's uh, really important and far more means more than required so the author is emphasizing that substantially more than hospitals correct uh collect and 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 the value of this is this is essentially what the author is saying how much more um uh, do researchers collect um and and this comparison is given to to, to to kind of back that far more thereby what is the value of thereby over here what is the value of thereby it's an outcome, therefore, yes. Thereby escalating costs of data collection, storage, and analysis. So this thereby means as a, as a result of this, these things happen. The cost of blah, 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 those costs go up, okay? Although limiting information collection could increase the risk that researchers will overlook uh, facts relevant to study. So all there's a contrast word, it's, it's a keyword. When you look at this strategy, this is what we call as a classic defense against weakness strategy that's there. So, uh, so the author is saying is if you limit information collection, then you, you know there's a possibility that researchers will overlook certain things that are relevant to the study. FNM content again, this is really important. This contention, this assertion comes from FNM that such risk, which is never entirely eliminable, which eliminable from research, which eliminable from research means you can't entirely eliminated that risk would still be small in most cases another keyword really important the author is saying only in research of entirely new treatments are new and unexpected variables uh, likely to arise only is a really important keyword in the context of of cr as well as in the context of rc only means there's just one condition the words such as only just they're, they're what we call as segment words there are always inferences that come from them. So there's one scenario in which new and unexpected variables arise. Well, that is when you're talking about treatment, uh, new treatments or so. Okay. Again, really important to make sure you 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 visualize whatever you're reading. You're visualizing and comprehending to this level. So um, a very simple summary of this: FNM really contend that hey, per FNM, that's where you have this over here. Uh, you know, medical research can be improved, improved. You can see the the the, the up arrow in this case by, by moving towards larger, simpler trials. Currently, we collect too much data, which leads to increase in costs. Uh, and 
yes there's a possible negative of collecting less data but again that that negative even when you collect more data it can't be removed and 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 the risk is small with the exception of this one research where new treatments come in everyone clear with the with with the uh, with, with, with with essentially this if you were to summarize this in in um, uh, uh, in one word, you say, hey, there's a simpler trial that could happen, uh, and, and the benefits of a simpler trial, those are, well, with less data collection, uh, those benefits are explained. So everyone's with me so far? Okay, good. A few more yeses would be nice. Okay. Then let's go to the second paragraph. It says, FNM propose, again, we had the first one, FNM assert, now we have FNM propose, not only again another keyword so there's a the second thing that they're proposing because it says not only which means but also not only that researchers researchers limit data collection on individuals but also that researchers enroll more patients in clinical trial thereby what's the value of thereby here what's what's what role does thereby play in this sentence as the outcome of it the result of it and um, and and the author is very explicit about saying this, and it's really important you, you read it with with the, with the same sentiment, thereby obtaining a more representative sample of the total population with the disease under study. So so essentially, the first thing is you see here not only but also, which means there's a second thing, and that second recommendation that that we have is that you you enroll more patients, and because of this, you get a more representative sample. More representative means it's a comparative word. More is a comparative word. And whenever you see a comparison, you say, what, what am I comparing to? And clearly, if it's a proposal, then it probably is going to be a comparison to how things are done currently, okay? uh, which is something that we see from the next line. Often researchers restrict study participation to patients who have no ailments besides those being studied. A treatment judge successful under those ideal conditions can then be evaluated uh, under normal conditions. Why did the author use the word then over here? What role does it play? It's a sequence, yes, really important, or a condition. And, and that's something which, again, the reason why we, I'm, I'm emphasizing on these keywords is as you see these keywords, visual maps should start forming in your brain. And, and, and that will only happen if you're aware of what these keywords do, not only, but also thereby currently often, okay, if you're aware of those keywords and, and, and you know what you have to form right when you see that, uh, 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 then, then you're going to find that reading that passage becomes a lot easier. Okay, very similar to you know when you're driving, if you see a stop sign, you know what you need to do. If you're driving, you see a red light, you know what you need to do. Your brain's aware of it. You don't have to think twice about it. That's the level of comfort I want you to get to this. Now, how many of you, when you were actually reading this, uh, had that visual map in your mind that there is a sequence or there's a condition that's happening here? And the moment you read, then. How many of you have that? Not, okay. How many of you did not? I want you to start developing that. I, that that's what we call as visualization, by the way, that Harsha has been talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, the more you build it, the faster you will get, the better you will get at RC. And and and, and the, the, the stronger is going to be your conviction while rejecting... Um, incorrect options and selecting the correct ones okay so what's happening here there's a proposal the first is hey the first one was collect less data but the second proposal that's there is to increase the size of the trial and the, and 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 there's a word there by so the so so we're really just saying that as the result of it you you obtain a much more representative sample okay the current process is then explained and uh, and, and and the current one is that we we only study those people who have this one disease, this is a kind of ideal conditions, and then there's a, a, a sequence. If something's just successful here, you know, we move towards normal conditions. <coughs> so again, very simple, benefits of a larger trial. Broadening the range of trial participants, FNM suggests, again, 
this is a suggestion by FNM, would enable researchers to evaluate another keyword means figure out the pros and cons of a, treat, uh, uh, a treatment's efficacy for diverse patients under various conditions and to evaluate the effectiveness of different patient subgroups. Now, this is, is essentially, whenever you look at this and say, hey, this is a complex statement, do I spend all the time? The first thing you have to really just figure out is, what's the role? What's the role of evaluate the efficacy of diverse patients under various conditions, uh, evaluate the a treatment's efficacy for diverse patients and effectiveness, blah, 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 blah. What's the job that this entire section is, is playing? What's the job that this section is playing? Can you guys tell me? What is the job that this section is playing? Talking about the benefits. Yes, as per FNM, what would be the what would be the benefits of it? It's justifying why you should broaden the range of trial participants. And you can really see some of you are, are have gotten it that what's the job that it's doing. Others are explaining what's written over there. Okay, and really important to, to to kind of read it with that context. And then the author really says, so so the job that the, all of this is saying is that that hey, it will, according to FNM, this would be the benefit. And what's the benefit to evaluate a treatment's efficacy for diverse patients under various conditions? So you know, different kinds of patients probably have different conditions. You know, someone has has just that illness. Others have two or three other uh, illnesses, and so on and so forth. Then the author goes, for example, the value of a treatment for a progressive disease may vary according to a patient's stage of the disease. Patient's ages may also affect. So this is really just saying, hey, the examples in which you'll get new insights over here. Okay. So so um, so that's something that what the author uh, 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 says with, with this particular paragraph. Okay. So if you were to then summarize this entire passage, uh, paragraph one is, is to really where the authors, so overall the authors proposing, uh, it, it's describing a, a trial where, where two proposals are, are, are kind of described by FNM. Uh, the first proposal is collect less data, which will lead to lower costs. And, and according to FNM, the risk would not be as much. The second is to expand the scope of the trial uh, to get a much more representative sample. That's what the author is doing. He's describing two proposals that FNM have to to improve medical trials. Okay, so with that, let's go through our questions over here. I think we've already done that. Okay, you can really see different experts can come up with different summaries for the entire passage. I'd said two proposals, and and how they would improve, uh, how the the improvements that they would provide. Another expert said two prong proposal to improve medical research explain. Again, very similar stuff, different words. That's something that can, can happen. Okay. When you guys read it, did you come up with some other interesting things that you want to share before you started solving questions? Very similar. Okay. Same, same. Nothing extra. Good. So let's go to our first question. And, and this is how you guys pulled. Over here, 56% of you got it right, uh, or 32 of you who chose choice D. This is indeed the correct answer. Okay. <clears throat> let's talk about. Uh, and I'm going to hide this. I'm going to bring my short answer pod once again. Let's look at choice C. Choice C was really popular here. And, and, and uh, let's look at this and say, choice C says evaluating something, which means looking at the pros and cons of something. Does the author look at the pros and cons of, of, of these two proposals? No. Evaluating what? An analysis of something, an analysis of certain shortcomings of current medical research practices. Now, 
my question really is is there an analysis that's presented to you in the passage that's the first question you should have asked let's kind of look at this over here is there a is there an analysis of certain shortcomings that is present to you yes there are some there is some to a certain degree does the author talk about the pros and cons of that analysis even if you say yes to it does the author talk about the pros and cons of that analysis the author says hey this analysis has not done well here is uh, this is where it has done well no the author doesn't talk about the pros and cons of that analysis let's kind of look at this if i were to draw a parallel scenario and uh, and 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 someone analyzed google stock just bring this over here I think choice c no does the author talk about evaluate that analysis so let's do this Is the author saying F and M are good here and F and M are wrong here? Is that the is the author saying that? No. Would that not be an evaluation of F and M's analysis if the author truly did that? So the parallel is someone analyzed Google stock. You have a you know you have an equity research report over there, and then you really say, hey, in these areas this research is correct, in these other areas. That research is wrong. That's an evaluating that analysis. Is the author doing that? No, it's not. And which is why choice C is wrong. People who chose choice C. Sorry about that, guys. My my audio went away. Okay. Choice D is is in line with what we talked about. It's describing the proposed changes, two ways in which uh, clinical trials are conducted. That's absolutely correct. Okay. And then choice C e, exp explaining how medical researchers have traditionally conducted clinical trials and how such trials are likely to change. We don't know. If these changes would be put into effect. There's no likelihood over there, which is why this one is wrong. Questions about this or learnings from this? People who got this wrong, 58% of you got it right. The remaining, about 42% got it wrong. What did you learn from this? What is it that you're going to uh, uh, do to ensure you don't make the same mistake? Guys, what were the learnings? Can I get some responses here? Author and someone else. There were no learnings? Because don't mark answers in a hurry. Good. Okay. Let's look at need to make sure I eliminated it's really important to eliminate every answer choice with 100% confidence identify keywords evaluate means pros and cons and we've used this word discuss this again and again and again all right this is how we did with question number two choices a and d were popular choice a is our correct choice we're going to really look at why that is the case let's look at this over here which of the followings can be inferred from the passage about a study of category of patients referred to often researchers restrict 
participations to patients who have no ailments besides those being studied. So the first thing is, even before you look at answer choices, read a question stem, and especially when you see such question stems, uh, uh, and, and, and really just say, hey, uh, what what is the passage talking, what is the, the question stem talking about? And then given my read on the passage, what can I say about about this okay and, and and we're talking about these patients who have no ailments just that those that particular ailment these are the ideal conditions that we talked about and and, and as you can really see uh with regards to your pre-thinking what you can really say is uh, uh that there are two things you can really say the results are limiting you know they only apply to probably a small subset such studies only cover ideal conditions you could really also go to the point and really saying that hey Something that's found successful under in such studies may never be used because it still has to be evaluated. So two step. Remember this where we said uh, would then then be evaluated under ideal conditions. So because you have you still need an evaluation, this means that there's a possibility what's successful in these conditions might never see the light of the day, might not be useful um, overall at all. Another inference could be that only provides one state. Such studies require a two-state approach towards uh, towards evaluating that drug. All of this are, are these are valid inferences. You can really see just if you understand this, you can come up with all of these over here. With that, let's kind of go through our pre-thinking uh, or go through the answer choices. Choice A as is in line with our pre-thinking that the findings are limited. We already know you know, uh, these are just ideal conditions. They then need to go through another set of evaluation. Okay, but 59% of you selected this. That's that's great. Choice B talks about how expensive it, it is to create those ideal conditions. The passage does not talk about it. So, so we definitely cannot infer that. Choice C talks about it would be the best way to sample the total population. In fact, you know, the passage doesn't talk about it. According to F and M, it's not the best way. There are better ways that exist. Um, people who chose choice D, lots of you who chose choice C, it will allow researchers to limit information collection without increasing the risk that important variables could be overlooked. Okay. This one, I'm sorry, it, uh, it says correct over here. It's not the correct option. It's choice A is the correct option. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the, um, uh, uh, marker there is, is wrong. So, so. Okay. Now, for those of you who, who chose choice D, what kind of uh, what kind of what mistake did you do? Who would choose choice D? D for delta. What kind of person would choose choice D? Someone who's actually mixing paragraph one and paragraph two. Remember, paragraph one and paragraph two are two independent recommendations. Okay, limiting information collection and costs are, are discussed in paragraph one. Okay, and, and, and this one is about broadening the range of part, uh, participants. So if you chose choice D, you're kind of mixing paragraph one and paragraph two, and that's really important that you don't do that. Uh, similarly, in the context of this ideal study, the accuracy of findings is, is, is not really talked about. Okay. But 40% of you got this wrong. What were the primary reasons you got this wrong? Can you guys type them out? And how are you going to ensure? Someone who chose either choice D or choice E. What were the reasons? Oh, absolutely. I can show the poll. Thirteen of you chose choice. Uh, D over analyzing. Okay. Options weren't difficult. I mean, there's no reason to choose any other option but option A in this case. So, so I wouldn't say options are difficult. I think the when you're really saying that options are difficult, what you you're really saying is, hey, you know, maybe I I, I it's okay that if I that I wasn't able to get to uh, the the correct option. That's okay because the options are difficult. And and frankly, when you do that, you're not taking the learning from that and, 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 and you know, giving yourself the opportunity to improve. There's no way that even if choice A did not exist, there's no way 
that you would mark either of um, choices B, C, D, or E as correct. You'd have to come up with another correct option because all of these choices are absolutely wrong. Okay. And, and again, this is it's, it's, it's important to, to spend the time to figure out why did you make a mistake? What is it that you're going to do to avoid making such mistakes again? Let me select, uh, give the next one. This is how you guys pulled for question three. Question three, you guys did much better. 64% of you got it right. Um, choice, the only other popular choice was uh, choice A. Let's kind of look at this over here. And, and 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 the reason I'm happy about question three is because question three, the question stem was slightly tricky. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is where the question said, said, it can be inferred from the passage that a study limited to patients, that we're talking about the same study over here, would have which of the following advantages over the kind of study that uh, proposed by FNM. And the reason why this was slightly challenging, in my opinion, was because this you had to truly infer this is something that that wasn't uh, listed in the passage. And the very fact that you guys did so well with this was 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 really good. So even before we go to the answer choices, we have to do our pre-thinking and really say, hey, what's the advantage of current way of doing things um, where we are limiting uh, participation to to uh, to just to those patients who have just that and 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 no other uh, uh, ailment overall and and um, and essentially, one of the big advantages would be that I would only need to focus on a certain subset. I wouldn't have to worry about these other conditions that would happen. Even if you read the passage, that's, this is something that you would get. Say, so, hey, I won't have to worry about other ailments. I'm getting a very pure set. See, the analysis would be simpler. That's something that I would really just say. It'll be easier to figure out if something works for this group. And then in step two, I'm going to figure out uh, in, in the generic case. That's the benefit that I, that would be there. Okay. And when you look at this choice, A says it would yield more data and its findings would be more accurate. When you look at the context of this, you know, in the context, we didn't really talk about the amount of data that that's that's yielded. In fact, you could infer that it'll just this piece would yield the S data. The accuracy of findings is absolutely not mentioned at all. Similarly, cost is not mentioned in this context. Choice C uh, uh, is, is something which, which, which is inferable. Why? Because if you're only studying the patients who have, um, uh, who, have uh, who have just this one disease and have no other diseases, so ideal condition, you won't have to analyze so many variables or, or so many things overall. Okay. People who chose choice D, again, not that many. Uh, uh, they they kind of did not read the question stem. So this is not the advantage of what the, the study that the author is talking about, but uh, FNM's proposal um, and same thing uh, uh, is, is more about FNM's proposal, not this particular study. Okay. Now, one of the things that you really saw was about 64% of you got this right. This makes it a medium difficulty question. And, and as you improve the understanding of the passage, you, you know, you guys as a group are starting to do better and better. Can I show your answers? Yes, I show your answers before every uh, uh, before discussing the question. Here are the options. Here is how you chose. Again, the confusion after spending so much time uh, while reading the passage should not be there. Okay, so so uh, that's really important. We did actually even better in uh, in question number four. This is question number four, and this is these are the stats again. A was slightly popular, and and C uh, choices B and E practically no one chose. So I'm going to focus on A, C, and D. Well, the question asks why does the author really just say patients' ages may also affect a treatment's efficacy? And this was uh, very simple. Why? Because if you understood the context, you can really talk about you can see why is it that the author mentions this statement over here okay and 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 this is something that you say hey this is an example of of the benefits of um, the proposal that fnm have fnm second proposal okay um, so that's something that's there uh, choices 
choice A uh, says identifying the most critical variable, differentiating subgroup. Okay. Again, the first thing is, is that the purpose of why it's stated number one? Number two, can you even say that it was the most critical variable as per this? Can you say this? Yes, no? No, you can't. The second is, is that the reason why he's saying is this, this the author's goal to really say, hey, age is the most critical variable? No, the answer is not that. Okay, no one chose B. Some people chose C. Indicate why progressive diseases may require different treatments uh, at different stages. Okay. First of all, it's a different example. But again, is that the purpose of it? Of, 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 of citing that? The reason why, do you know the reason why progressive diseases require different treatments? Do you know which chemicals are out of whack? Do you know which, do you have the causality over there? Absolutely not. And and, and someone who's choosing this is not visualizing this answer choice first as to what this answer choice is saying and then putting it in the context of the passage. You've faltered on one or both grounds. Someone who's chosen choice C. Really important before you really decide on or pass a judgment on an answer choice uh, as to whether it's correct or not, make sure you read and understand what that answer choice is saying. Just do it in ind independently. How many of you do this? And this is really important. You read an answer choice, ask yourself, is this right or wrong before visualizing the answer choice in its entirety, independently? How many of you do this? Let me just say this. You read the answer choice and rather than visualizing what that choice is saying, you say, is this right? Is this wrong? Ask the question. Stress your brain. Okay. Do not do that. Get into the habit of visualizing the answer choice first. The moment you do that, that right or wrong question would be a lot simpler. You know, nine out of 10 times, just even the need to go back to the passage would go away. For example, in this case, you really say, if you visualize and say, why progressive diseases may require different treatments, you'd ask yourself, do I know the reason why progressive diseases require treatment? Absolutely not. The author has not mentioned that. Even if you had not gotten the context, you would have remembered the author has not mentioned there is, this is reason one, reason two, reason three, as to why progressive diseases require different treatments. Okay. And, and when you do that, as I said, you will save a ton of time. Your accuracy will go up. If choice D is correct, we'll illustrate a point about the value of enrolling. So it's just an example of the benefit of all of this. Okay. Um, choice C, again, no one chose. So, so that's there. So that's one takeaway that I want you to have. Spend the time to, to, to read the answer choices. Let's go to the last question. The last question was, I think, the most interesting one. This is where, as a group, your accuracy was the lowest you can see a split jury uh choices a b c and d are all really popular so um can i show the poll don't use the word uh p o l e p o l l p o l e is is, is a completely different poll and again we all make these mistakes i have done these so uh, this is how you did for question four. This is question five. We're going to move towards question five. A, B, C, and D are all popular. And question five is, is, is I think, what I call as a generic detailed question. According to the passage, which of the following describes the result of the way in which researchers generally conduct trials. Again, read the question. What does the word result mean? We're talking about an outcome. So what we're really saying is we know how the author mentions how researchers generally can conduct trials and which of the following is an outcome, is a result of that, okay? In other words, the effect of it. How many of you, before you're looking at answer choices, kind of inferred this from the question stem? We're looking at an outcome of how we do things today. How many of you inferred this?
Okay, perfect. So, so let's look at this. There are two things that you can infer about, and, and I like like the hashtag me too. Uh, uh, that we can infer uh, about about these things. First of all, first is in in paragraph one. You know, you collect a lot more data, and you have a lot higher costs. That's one of the outcomes of the current wave. The second is you you you're doing a two stage trial, so the result is applicable only. In, 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 uh, there's limited applicability. You need to go through a two-stage evaluation. Uh, that's something that you can really just say. And then you know, there's a possibility that something that's gone through stage one might not even be uh, past stage two. Okay. So these are the two things that we can pre-think over here. Okay. So and 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 when you look at this over here, a choice A is in line with what we said. They expend resources and storage of information likely to be irre irrelevant to the study that they are conducting. Okay. Let's look at choice C. A lot of you chose choice C. They compromise the, the risk of, of, of overlooking variables. They avoid the risk of overlooking variables that might affect their findings, even though doing so raises the research cost. It's a beautiful answer choice. It's designed to mess up your brain. And, and, and let's, I'm going to bring the passage again. Just give me one second. And let's kind of understand the word avoid. What does the word avoid mean? You say, if you say, I avoided failure, what do you mean? Did you fail? Yes, no. When you say, I, I avoided failure, you did not fail. Say, I avoided that road. Did you take that road? No. I avoided purchasing Google stock. Did you purchase Google stock? No, it's eliminate, bypass. Right? That's a great word to say in this context specifically. Although limiting information collection could increase the risk, blah, 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 blah. FNM contend that such risk never entirely eliminable. So according to FNM, NM, such risk is never entirely eliminable. Now, is there anything in the passage that, that, that makes you believe that the author believes that they are able to avoid such risk? No. There's nothing in the passage that says that, they are, that they're able to eliminate such risk by collecting so much information, way more than what hospitals collect. As a result of them collecting more information, by the way. Choice B, they sometimes compromise the accuracy of their findings by collecting and analyzing more information than is strictly required for their trials. You think about collecting more information than is strictly required. What is the downside that is that is discussed in the passage? When they collect more information, paragraph one. Do we talk about compromising accuracy? No, it's talk about in storing the, uh, the the cost of storing all of that. Right? Nothing with with compromising the accuracy. Choice is a cause and effect because of the really important keyword. Because they attempt to analyze too much information, they overlook facts that could emerge as relevant to this. Okay. Is there any information? And, and, and that's good uh, 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 contemplation. Was confused between choice A and C. And just after marking C, realized it should have been A. That, that's good contemplation. Make sure you avoid making that mistake. Let's go back to choice D. Because they attempt to analyze too much information, they come from, uh, they overlook facts. Nothing like this has been mentioned. There is no ca cause and effect that's mentioned specifically in the passage that that does it. Hey, they're analyzing so much, and and they they overlook facts. So choice D is also wrong. Okay. So with that, I've come to the end of you know the this practice part of this, we're now going to talk about how you guys can become experts in GMAT RC, but what is your takeaway has been so far? What have your takeaways been till date? In these two, two and a half hours, you've been there with us. What, what is that one thing that you're going to do 
to make sure you're better in RC. Never skim, read carefully. Focus on important words, read properly and visualize. Summarize, okay. Read with intention, I, I, I really like that. Uh, this is really important. This is the output that we are looking at. These are the best practices that I want you to inculcate so that you get this output. Okay, really, really important over here. And and especially because most of you are aiming for that 730 plus score. Okay, uh, and, and this is really important. Now, many of you would still be concerned as to, you know, do these things even work? Am I going to be able to do this uh, in time on the, on the real test? Let me just say this. We would not have account for three out of five, 700 plus scores if these strategies did not work. Okay. Uh, most people will tell you they'll teach you tricks to SGMAT RC. There is no trick to it other than building that skill to improve your ability to comprehend uh, information. And, 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 and this is a process where you have to do that deliberate practice. Now, it doesn't mean that it should, it would take you months. I can tell you with deliberate practice where you're giving yourself feedback, you can do that in, in 10 to 15 days as long or with, with about an effort of about 50 to 55 hours. As long as you give yourself that opportunity to learn, as long as you allow yourself that opportunity to learn. And allowing yourself that opportunity to learn really means that you don't worry about timing when, when you are in that process of learning. Okay. So, how many of you heard this advice uh, before? Read slowly in a time test or versus, I mean, this is something that very few test prep companies will tell you. I think there are a couple of companies, we and one other company that tells you that you've got to read and, and excel things slowly. Um, and, 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 and it's really important. Why? Because we understand it's the process of skill building that matters. Now, um, here's how things would pan out. If you, you, uh, are reading the passage slowly for a majority of passages after 10 to 15 days, after 30 to, to 50 hours of effort. Uh, and, and the range is, is because, you know, some of you are further along than others. Uh, you'd be able to read the passage if you read it slowly in about three minutes, which means you'd be able to answer uh, questions in about a minute or so. Even for the most challenging passages, okay, uh, you you take about four minutes to read the passage, and then you take about forty five seconds or point seven five minutes to answer the question. Usually, the nice thing about long passages is if you comprehend, it's really easy to answer those questions. Now, what's the length of a typical RC passage? How many words is a typical RC passage? About three fifty, really good. If you Google what's the typical reading speed, I think the answer that you would get is about 180, 190 uh, uh, words per minute. Okay, that's not how you read GMAT RC. That's your skimming speed. Um, the speed at which you need to read GMAT RC is what we call as the reading speed for uh, the speed to read a technical document or a semi-technical document. That's about 95 words per minute. Okay. This is where you will get to after 30 to 40, 50 hours of investment. Right now, you are probably between, most of you are probably between 30. If you want to get to that level of comprehension, 30 to 50 words per minute. And that's okay. Yes, complete assimilation of minutes. This is where you need to get to between 80 to 95. This is where you currently are. Okay. But you are not, your, your goal with regards to reading is to, to focus on comprehension. As you focus on comprehension, you become familiar with sentence structures. You, and, and those sentence structures repeat. You, you get way better at visualizing. And that's where you'll automatically go from the 30 to 50 to that, that 95 words per minute. Okay. Let that process be natural. Don't force. How long was the previous passage? I think it was around the 350 word mark. 
On the other hand, if you go towards speed reading and this, which is something that most of you do, you'd probably read the passage in about two minutes, but then you will do a lot of back and forth. You'd be confused. And, and typically it take between a minute and a half to two minutes to answer every question. Have people experienced this? They go through that speed reading process and then do that back and forth between the answer choices and the passage. And, and that back and forth not only wastes time, it also creates mental friction. You, you, you kind of start resisting RC uh, and, 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 and you need to reset yourself before solving you know, the next CR or the next SC question. Bottom line is, if you do this, the time to analyze and solve a question becomes really, really uh, uh, reduced considerably. And, and, and which is why, you know, when our students do this, they get good scores, which is why we account for 60% of all success that's reported on GMAT 11. This is not just in 2023. This is since the beginning of 2021. Okay. Um, and then what it means is all of these companies combined uh, account for just 40%. Um, yeah, I think people talk about five-star reviews. You have enough over there. Okay. Um, here's someone who scored a 740. Um, uh, uh, she went to Colombia. Uh, she's from, I think, Russia. She she said, the more you read, the greater is your skill. Um, and then she says, you should read all the text, not only the first and the last sentence. Uh, 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 as you, as long as you understand the whole paragraph, it will only take you thirty to fifty seconds to answer each question, and 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 read everything with what you know, uh, what we say as the SC hat, which is to infer the meaning of what you're what you're going towards going to read. Nishan says, when you, what you have to realize is that you have enough time to to do all questions. Okay, there's another guy who went to Colombia. Um, he had a very difficult journey, about two years. This, this debrief is one of the most uh, Valued debriefs on GMAT Club, and, um, and 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 he ultimately got to the strategy. He resisted the strategy for a really long time, but once he got to it, that's when he got got to that 740 score. Um, and as you can see, take three plus minutes to read, understand, and comprehend a short passage uh, uh, in in three minutes, or four plus minutes for that. Okay, and if ESR, you can see, despite doing this, despite having that initial investment, he was still able to. You know, get a B forty, B forty one, if I remember correctly, and um, and and um, answer questions on time. There's another student who got a seven sixty, um, and and um, and essentially, he went. He first did speed reading. Now, this is a guy who had um, cleared the IAS exam, who had done really well on the IAS exam in India before taking the GMAT, and and he essentially did speed reading. Uh, and, and got a B27. But once he applied all of these strategies, he was able to improve to a V41. And then you can really see, he says, the need to read passages repeatedly in both CR and RC reduced significantly. Okay. Um, when I says, I fare much better during these webinars than when I do custom quizzes on the EG platform, is this common? Um, I think it's major, uh, majorly a timing issue during doing custom quizzes, the fear of time running out. Do you suggest I do untimed quizzes till I get to the point and assimilate information faster? Great question. I'm sure a lot of people face this issue. And, and this is not just about RC. It's about building any skill. I recommend that you always start with the untimed piece. And then when once you achieve accuracy, and accuracy first, timing later is, is what our philosophy is, go back, solve a, a quiz on time step one, achieve the accuracy, uh, then one of the, the nice things about scholarly name quizzes is you have expert AI that tells you which are the questions on which you took longer than average. And, and then go back, analyze those questions, figure out why you took longer, address that issue, take the next untimed quiz. The nice thing about taking these quizzes untimed is, is, is that uh, you know you automatically statistically know what, what is your timing because even though you're taking it untimed, the, the system still captures that time for you. Another reason why people do better in these webinars is because you warm you up really, really well. And because we push you to stick around with us for two, two and a half hours, we your brain starts to get wired. So also make sure you do warm up before you do any quizzes. So the same way before doing any intense workout, you've got to do warm up. Otherwise, you would hurt yourself. Okay, this is no different. 
by the way if you've not subscribed to our youtube channel absolutely do so um, we are hitting about 300 uh, uh unedited raw debriefs where people talk about how did they prepare, what were their failure points, uh, what mistakes did they make during their prep, how did they overcome those mistakes. Any case, any strategy, any profile you want to really know about, that exists over here. It's the world's largest collection of, of GMAT debriefs out there. Okay. There are a couple of things I want to really talk about. You know, um, is the one recommended before giving GMAT? Absolutely. If you're an eGMAT student, if you're taking the test, please write us, write to our support team a week to 10 days in advance. We'll, we'll make sure that you are test ready and you have those warm-up strategies there. Okay. The, again, coming back to this, there are two things that I want to recommend over here. You know, a lot of people think if you want to get a high score on GMAT, quant, or verbal, you need to, to have those innate skills. Those skills are built over time. In fact, there are experts who will tell you that, especially private tutors. That's not the case. The so GMAT's a very excellible test. Uh, it's not rocket science, and 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 then there's a reason why the test is is built that when it's and and B schools appreciate that test. Okay. Um, the other thing is, yes, avid readers they do have an advantage. You know, they, they their initial ability is high, but just by being an avid reader, you cannot get to 90th percentile on GMAT RC. You can probably get to 60, 65th percentile, but not 90th, unless and until you you do conscious. Uh, reading or you follow these reading strategies. Okay. So how do you build those foundation skills? Always start with a master comprehension course. Master comprehension has three modules that are absolutely essential even before you go to the RC course. Understand how a sentence is built and you can really see how much information there's there. Understand where to pause and then we have the new module that is on meaning. That's the foundation of how to read a single sentence. That's after that, you go through the reading strategies concepts where we talk about the same concepts, but there's a lot more detail over there. There's a lot more evaluation, which is where you see these scores. Uh, once you've done this, that's when you go through the main point concepts and you go through detail concepts and, 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 and inference concepts uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But with all of this starts with you learning how to read a passage. There's no point solving questions if you don't know how to read a passage. And, and as you go through these concepts, make sure you understand the nuts and bolts of it. It's not about completing an exercise. It's not about just doing an activity. It's about making sure you analyze how we are doing it, what's the mindset that we have, and, 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 and which is where I want to ask you, how many of you spend those 30 minutes on just on main point one? If you've not done this, it's part of your free trial. Make sure you do that. Okay. Does V42 mean you've answered all questions correctly? Absolutely not. Most people who get to a V42 um, uh, make about seven to eight mistakes. It's just that they make mistakes on hard questions. Okay. Similarly, analyze every passage. One of the things that you'd see as you, you watch interviews on our YouTube channel is people who excel don't solve a lot of questions, but people who excel spend two, 2x or 3x as much time analyzing their mistakes as people who don't. Okay, that's really important. Make sure you do this. Have an attitude towards excelling RC. Don't hate it, love it. One of the benefits of doing RC is the moment you learn how you excel at GMAT RC, uh, you, when you learn how to do this, you learn how to essentially read information in any context. Contexts that are not familiar to you as well. And, and that's a, a really important skill that you need to have in life, not just for your GMAT, not just for your MBA, but also in life. Um, even if you're an engineer, you'd be able to, to, to read research on cellular biology and get the gist of it. You may not understand the nuts and bolts. You may not understand how, how essentially uh, 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 chemicals or proteins go through cellular walls, but you'll understand the nuts and bolts of what the author is trying to say. And that's really important. It's a really important skill, but you only build that skill we have that attitude of getting immersed and keep your, that attitude of visualizing information. Reading strategies make this easy to visualize information. They're tools that you can really see. Okay. And, and then every mistake is an opportunity to learn. A lot of people, they, they, they kind of uh, 
uh, they're sad when they make mistakes. And, and okay, to a certain degree, I understand. But but every mistake is an opportunity to learn. Uh, when I make mistakes, and I still do, I I am happy because there's something that challenged me. It's an opportunity for me to improve, and and that's kind of who I am. I mean, as a teacher, if I'm not improving every day, there's no point in me being a teacher because in the end, my job is to push the envelope both for myself as well as for my students. Okay. Build these core skills and, and you'd be golden. And for those of you who need help with a study plan, I'd be happy to share that. All right, guys, with that, uh, I want to thank you guys for, for, uh, for staying with me. If you need help with your study plan, you can click on this over here. Let me share this uh, this session PDF. Uh, let's get there. Okay. If you have any questions, whether it's about the GMAT, about your MBA, I'd be happy to answer those. And if you want to watch Nishant's interview, um, Anastasia's interview, or Rohit's interview, or go to our YouTube channel, you have a few links over here as well. Okay. With that, some feedback on the webinar, both on her, for Harsha and I, as well as any questions that you have, you can give the feedback over here on, on the right-hand side where you see the first one. If you have questions, those can go in the Q&A pod. All right. Thank you very much. And um, I wish you good luck. Okay, I got a question, which was like, how long does it take if you want to go from 600 to 730? Is it possible in round one? Um, it's the 8th of April for me right now. Uh, typically, 600 to 730 is about 160 hours of effort, uh, which I think for most people is about two, two and a half months or so. Okay. Um, so, so, yes, it's possible if you're spending, um, you know, 40 to uh, 20 to 25 hours a week on, on, on studying. How do you take time out for studying? Um, essentially, one of the big things is you've got to find a time slot. And, and to find a time slot, you've got to figure out uh, what is it that you, how you're going to change your daily schedule. Some people need to make sure that, um, that they, they cook in advance if, if that's taking their time. Some people have to kill certain aspects of, of their entertainment out of their days, you know. Um, uh, some watch less TV. Make sure that um, uh, uh, that 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 you tell your friends you won't be able to do play video games with them. Um, others need to focus on 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 studying when um, when when they are you know commuting back and forth from work. Um, essentially, one of the most important challenges is to make consistent time for study. You should not be thinking I'm going to study in this hour or that hour or so on and so forth. Just Thinking about just planning when you're going to study, blocking your calendar is really important. And it may not seem as, as critical a step, but when we take an action, when we write some things down, put them on our calendar, our propensity to do that is really, really important. It's really impactful, I'm sorry. Uh, another thing which I think is really important is to, um, to challenge yourself to say, okay, for the next five days, I'm going to put in these two hours. I'm going to stay really focused. And then on the sixth day, have a reward for yourself. And that reward better be something worthy. Okay. 6, 7 to 7, to 7.20 plus is typically about 75 to 80 hours uh, per day. Uh, so, so yeah, that's something that's there. 570 to 730 in 45 days, is that possible? Possibility, yes. Again, you're, you're looking at uh, 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 essentially about 200 to 210 hours. You divide that by 45, you're looking at about four, four and a half hours of effort every day. Um, is it possible? Yes. But, but you know, the first challenge for you is to find time to do that. And, and again, with, with our course, the beauty of this is because it's adaptive, you know, you you focus on 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 the areas that uh, that where you need the most help. Our quant course, for example, is not a single course; it's about ten thousand different courses. The course adapts on based on what you know and what you don't know. So you only study things um, uh, that 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 uh, that are relevant to you. And the system really just says, "Hey, tells you you don't need to study these things." 
how many points could one go up from test taking strategies after completing cementing so if you've done cementing if you've hit the metrics the bare minimum you you would get to is about 70th percentile many people get to about 80 85th percentile in in cementing test taking so which we call as test readiness uh, gets you gets you from wherever you le- you know whatever percentile you left in cementing to to 90 to 95th percentile so if you think about it, 80 percentile in, in SCCR and RC gets you to uh, uh, about V38, V39. Um, and with, from there, uh, 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 you know, test readiness can can get you to a V44, V45. Um, and, and the difference between a V38 and a V45 is, is, is the difference between essentially a 710 or a 760. Okay. Um, so, Vinay, if you need help with test readiness, write to um, uh, 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 to the support team. Where can you watch previous webinars? On our YouTube channel, you have those. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, on our YouTube channel, the, all the webinars are in a, in a single playlist. You can watch them. Okay. All right, guys, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. It was a pleasure uh, having you guys, and I look forward to seeing you on uh, on EGMAT. Uh, okay, you can write to me at rajat at e-man.com. Let me actually respond to Vinay's uh, question with my email address so that you guys can um, uh, can write to, to me. Also, if you've not connected with me on LinkedIn, do that. Uh, we, I have upwards of 20,000 students, I think, right now who are connected with me. If you want to reach out to someone at any top B school, uh, my my network would be a way for you guys to do that. Okay, thank you, and have a wonderful day.